All right, grab your Bibles tonight and go with me to the book of James. This is our fifth night in the book of James, and we have arrived this evening at chapter 2. And um, I think our journey has been um, fun, enriching, rewarding, um, and exciting, and very much needed so far. Uh, we've been talking about James's theme in the very beginning is joy in the midst of trials. That we can have joy if we know why the trial is happening. We can have joy because we know that that test uh, produces a genuineness in our faith. It also um, develops mature faith. And those are, those are very powerful things. We've also been talking about distinguishing between testing and temptation, two very different things. We've affirmed the fact that God should never be connected in our minds as we think about temptation. God cannot be tempted, and God also does not tempt. We are tempted when we're dragged away, when we're enticed and lured, remember, by our own evil desires. And so we've spoken about that recently. We also spoke last week specifically about dealing with anger before it deals with us. And um, that's a very needed topic, I believe, probably in most of our lives. Uh, lots of frustration these days. And so I think that's a valuable thing to, to talk about. Also, last week the main theme was don't just be hearers of the word, but be what? Doers of the word, right? We have to do it. We have to do what it says, or we'll be like a man who looks at himself in the mirror and then walks away and forgets what he looks like. It doesn't even make sense. And so, so our, our goal tonight is to not just learn Scripture. It's truly to allow the Scripture to be ingrained in us and planted in us so that we become obedient unto it. And the more we put Scripture in us, the more we put ourselves in Scripture, the more we're going to be like Christ. And so I applaud you for being here tonight. Um, all that being said, uh, we're going to launch off this evening in Chapter 2 by watching our next installment of the um, Francis Chan uh, video. Just absolutely fantastic. Um, I want to start off with a poem, and a um, little rhyme really is all it is. I heard it years ago, and I think it, it um, springboards into really what compelled James to write. It says, full many people go to church, as everyone knows. Some go to close their eyes, and some to eye their clothes. And I, I think, as I thought about that little poem, that little rhyme, that it, it really gets inside for me the reason that James is writing this. Um, we face this issue today. I think Francis Chan gets at it well. There's, there's not a one of us that doesn't have an inner inclination, a sinful side that tends to look someone up and down and decide if they're, they're worthy of my time. Um, if they're a, a favorite, am I going to show this person um, you know, respect and honor? Uh, the early church dealt with that from the beginning. That's what James is getting at. This is not a, a 20th, 21st century issue. It's an issue that, that really surfaced in every Christian community, in every social fabric, in every finance, you know, it's financial distinction, racial distinction, whatever it was. Every Christian community had to deal with this. And so James is talking to them about it, and praise God, now the Lord's talking through him you know, to us about it. So I want to start off with really just verse 1 um, and just kind of title this, if I can, Everybody is Somebody, right? Everybody is Somebody. And so here's what James says in verse 1. I think we're just going to get through five verses or so tonight. We'll see how it goes. My brothers, as believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ, don't show favoritism. I'm going to do this all night long. I'm going to offer you Danny's paraphrase, Okay. And my paraphrase in this would be, in practicing your faith, don't play favorites in the church. In practicing your faith, don't play favorites in the church. If you were to um, interpret this directly from the original language, it would say, don't show partiality. And that word partiality is, is the first word that I want to try to talk about with you tonight, because that word literally means that which receives face or that which lifts up the face. Okay, let me say that again. That which receives face, or that which lifts up the face. In other words, the idea is a person scans the features of a new face that's come through the door, right? 
So the first time you met me, the first time I met you, we, we did a scan on one another, right? And we do it with everybody we meet. When they come into the church, we scan them, and an instant evaluation takes place in our mind. When you did it to me, does this guy look like a pastor? Does he act like a pastor? Could he be my pastor? How am I going to vote for this guy as pastor, right? But we all do it, whoever it is. If somebody new walked into this room tonight, I'm going to paint a scenario for us after a while. How would we evaluate them? Uh, and, as, and based on that evaluation, fellowship is either given or withdrawn, right? Automatically. I see it every Sunday morning. Somebody walks through the door, and if you see somebody that might connect with you in an age group, I've seen church members do it, they'll scurry over and say, Hi, how are you? We have a Sunday school class. It may just be perfect for you, right? And then we do that. And I'm glad that we do. We should do it to every single person that walks through the door. Um, so, so what James is talking about is accepting or accepting a, with an, or, or receiving that person with an accepting smile or a rejecting frown, right, based on the faces that you see. Um, and James is condemning this type of behavior. He's condemning the evaluation process. He, he's condemning the showing face to someone, right? And I think he's condemning this, as I begin to think about it and look through Scripture, he's condemning it because there's examples of Christ doing exactly the opposite. Did Jesus show partiality? Did God show partiality? And that's what Francis Chan is getting at. Um, Jesus didn't show any partiality ever whatsoever. Luke chapter 20, verse 21 and 22 records a question that Jesus' opponents asked him. They, they recognized, teacher, we know that you do not receive the face is the way it's actually interpreted in the Greek. Interesting. In other words, Jesus, we know you don't look somebody up and down and decide if they're worthy of your attention the way everybody else does, right? The New Testament stresses God's the same, right? It stresses that God will show no partiality in judging husbands or wives or children or slaves or masters. Um, even Paul talks about the same subject. James knew all of this, right? Paul insisted that God showed no partiality racially or religiously towards who? Jews or Greeks. And that was a big discussion in the early church. Who's the gospel for? Is the gospel really for whosoever will? It's one of the big conversations in Calvinism right now. Did God elect certain people to be saved? Did he elect certain people to be damned? And scripture, as I read it, says no. God's love is for whosoever will, right? God's love for all of us. Praise God. Because I get to be a part of it, right? Praise God, you get to be a part of it. God did, Jesus didn't show face to you. He didn't look you up and down the way humans do. He accepted you as only, as only God does. So, so James paints another example. In the last section that we looked at, uh, be hearers of the word, be hearers and doers of the word, and don't be like a man who looks at himself in a mirror and walks away and forgets what he looks like. Good example, good preacher, right? He's given illustrations. People connect with that. He does it again right here in chapter 2. Suppose a man, verse 2 through 4, comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes, and a poor man in shabby clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, here's a good seat for you, but say to the poor man, you stand there or sit on the floor by my feet. Have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? It's an illustration, isn't it? And literally the text says this when you're talking about the rich man, having gold rings on his fingers in a bright toga. That's the literal language being used. And, and if you know New Testament um, climate and contextual features of the world in that day, the only person who wore a bright toga, you like this right now, was a politician campaigning for office. In other words, he wanted to be seen, right? Okay. We have some politicians right now wearing bright togas, don't we? In major ways. And so that's the language being used. This was a wealthy man, rings on his fingers, wearing a bright toga, the best dressed man in the city, right? 
Impressive. Impressive. But now in sharp contrast to this impressive person, a poor man in shabby clothes. Now listen to this. The word translated poor man suggests a cringing beggar. Okay? Someone who didn't have enough food, someone who didn't have enough clothes to even get by. Probably today we'd say a street person or the common term, at least for a woman, is what? A bag lady. Okay. And that's, that's who James is referring to. So the overarching question that I think the text says to me is, how am I going to treat people? So let's let the task all of us. How are you going to treat people? How is our church inside these walls going to treat people? How is our church outside of these walls in this community going to treat people? How are you as an individual in society going to treat people? Um, I started reading about this. It's interesting that the early church took these words out of James real seriously, really seriously. They actually produced a manual, okay, on how to behave. And, and, I, and I've got the quote. And here was the, the manual um, writing to the Christian communities of James' world. If a poor man or woman, either of the district or of the other district, should come in and there's no place for them, thou presbyter, Make place for such with all thy heart, even if thou wilt sit on the ground, that there should not be respecting the person of man, but only respecting God. So that was instructions to the presbyter, all right? That's the minister, okay? That's what they were instructed to do and to be based on what James said. So, so we have to think about how our, how our actions have impacted people. I was recently um, doing a service uh, for one of our members who passed away, and um, Jim Bronstad, and um, wonderful celebration of his life. And I just learned a whole lot about his impact on people back when you know the, the state home was going strong here in Corsicana, the IWF orphanage, that is. And um, Jim served there, and one of the young girls who grew up under his care came and talked about how much she loved him. But then, but then she backed it up with this story. She said, and I used to come to First Baptist Church, but based on what happened to me there, I never stepped in church again. Now, thankfully, she said, I feel like the Lord spoke to me through you. And if I were back in Corsicana, I think I'd come back to church. And I said, you got to go where you are. But think about that. And she told me what happened. I'm not going to repeat all of it. But it was an issue like this. Where she was made to feel lesser than. Where she was looked up and down and, and didn't pass muster, according to somebody. I was reading about Tennessee Williams, you know, the famous playwright, correct? His family moved to another city during his childhood. True story, right? And he and his sister, the story says, they wanted to join the local church's choir. But because of their station in life, the story said, they were made to feel like social untouchables. And here's my question. What if the talents of Tennessee Williams had been gleaned by the church rather than just the secular world? Can you imagine the impact that guy could have had in kingdom work? We have to think about how impacting that our, our reactions can be to people. Not look somebody up and down and say famously, disgustingly, that's where I sit. It's happened in this church. I've heard people say it. I heard that come out of one woman's mouth in our sanctuary. Or somebody looking somebody up and down and saying, that's not how we dress here. Take your cap off. Now, I agree the cap should come off. I'm fine with that. But is that the most important thing as we try to win somebody to Christ and discipleship and the church, right? Or somebody walks in with a drink in their hand because they don't know the rules. I get it. I don't think my kids are not going to bebop in there with a Dr. Pepper in their hand. But sometimes somebody who's unchurched might do that because they don't know any better. 
it's social etiquette, but they don't know the rules. We can't totally oust them and pass judgment upon them because they didn't get it right. Correct? We have to think. So verse 4 becomes pretty important. James is, is being strong. Have you not discriminated among yourselves after his little illustration and become judges with evil thoughts? So all of a sudden, the people who are judging get judged in James's letter, right? The judges get judged. Very interesting. Two questions James poses, right? And they both demand the answer yes. I'm going to paraphrase again. Here it is. Um, you have made prejudiced distinctions among yourselves, haven't you? You become judges with evil thoughts, haven't you? The only answer to those questions is what? Yes, you have, right? Yes, you have. Now that word distinction, let's talk about that. That's the word used. In mine it says, have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges? Um, but maybe you have made prejudiced, prejudiced distinctions among yourselves. That word distinctions may mean to separate or divide. By judging and seating two visitors as they did, the people portrayed a prejudiced division among its members. You see, when we act that way, other people hear, other people see, and somehow that ideology that's in our hearts, it's ingrained in us, it's somehow affirmed, and we somehow say, well, that's okay. That's how we do things. We're divided among social class and the way somebody dresses. I had somebody this past week, I invited them to church, and the first thing they asked me, can we dress casually? No. I grew up, my dad would not let me wear shorts to church. Even on Sunday night in West Texas in the middle of August. It was terrible. You're not wearing shorts to that church building. So I grew up in that. I get it. Many of you are in the same vein. All right? I get it. But what was my answer to be to her? You wear what? You wear the best you got. Wear what you have and come. Because everybody's somebody at First Baptist Church. Because Christ accepted me, he'll accept you. We're not going to show partiality over what somebody wears or, or doesn't wear. Right? We can't do that. But let me let me read this. I, I found I found this um, illustration. I think it's just better if I read it. Sociologist Gerhard Lenski made a study of Christian attitudes in the Detroit area. He found that Protestant churches desire people like us in our socioeconomic level. Another investigator recorded specific examples of discrimination within churches. One church opposed wearing choir robes for a children's Easter program. The purpose, the reason they opposed it, was to allow the children to display their new Easter outfits because their mamas wanted to see them. Right? The result, though, was that several children who couldn't afford those new clothes, they chose to stay home. A further outcome of the event was that the poor family showed no more interest in the church or in the Lord. A woman with a questionable background professed faith in Christ. For several weeks, she and her children came to the church, and then suddenly their attendance stopped altogether. She complained that the church people made her feel she was beneath them. One leading member had warned people not to associate with her because of her past life. When she stopped coming, the regular members took an I told you so attitude. They accused their prejudiced conduct by judging that she quit coming because her profession of faith wasn't real anyway. Okay? That can happen to any church I've been in. I think Francis Chan is right. This is so hard because we all deal with this on some level. It's a real thing. It was real then. It's real now. So, so let's give our case study. All right. Let's suppose, goodness, let, let's do a Wednesday night attendance. Okay. Let's suppose tonight we look around this room. Look around. You recognize every face in here? Yep. These, these are us, right? I mean, you're not seeing anybody brand new. But let's suppose a new family popped down the stairs tonight, solidly middle class. Dad's wearing slacks. Nice button-up shirt, kids are in tow, well-behaved, good posture, standing straight, hair cut perfectly, smells like cologne, perfume, here they come in. Mother, father, everybody's looking sweet. What happens to them when they walk through the door? 
I would imagine that they're going to be easily greeted. Uh, they're probably going to be in, say it. Actively recruited. Actively recruited. <laughs> Somebody's going to say, hey, we're so glad that you're here. Um, can we tell you about Sundays at our church? Can we answer any questions for you? What brings you to our town? If they stay in the church for any length of time, somebody's inviting them to a Sunday school class. Who knows? Somebody in this room may even say, hey, you want to go out for ice cream afterwards tonight so we can get to know each other? And you're going to feel safe, right, to do that. And if they stay here any more length of time, depending on some spiritual level that's respectable, the guy's probably going to be asked to be a deacon. The kids are going to be encouraged to go over to the youth group. We may even introduce them to our grandchildren so that they'll be here to help them feel welcome. Second family comes in over issues that we don't know. They somehow are on welfare. Clothes aren't new. Maybe tattered. Hair might be greasy. No breads in the girl's hair. No smell of aftershave and perfume. Homely looking. Maybe even frightening. Maybe a rotten tooth right out front. Tattoo where everybody can see it. Who knows what it is. But just paint a scenario. Do you see how real this is? I am not getting on to anybody. Because I think y'all are wonderful people. But I think it's natural for us to easily be drawn to the one and not easily be drawn to the other. And that's exactly what James says. Don't show favoritism. And we're just apt to do it. I think that's the scripture tonight. Is that you have to put this into real life. People don't want charity. They want dignity, right? So the church has to be about reaching out to poor people. And that's where we're going now in verse 5. We have to be about this because verse 5 to me is powerful. Listen, my dear brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom he promised those who love him? All right, let's paraphrase again. That's our theme tonight. Here's my paraphrase. God has chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith. Has he not? He's asking another one of those questions. What's the only answer? Yes. yes, he has. Right? And you can't deny God's interest in the poor. So I want to take a few minutes chasing that. Um, God's interested in the poor. It's scriptural. It, it, it's, it's right down the line. In Luke chapter 6, verse 20. All right? Blessed are you poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Jesus said. In his first sermon to his hometown synagogue, what does Jesus say? The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the good news to the poor. It's interesting. So without question, we talked about this a little bit last week, without question the early church targeted the poor. Totally. The church was made up of the poor. There's no aristocracy in the church. I mean, I'm going to list a few names here in a second. But by and large... These are, these are slaves. These are, these are poor people. These are not the, um, these are not the haves. They're the have-nots. They're not the social upper crust. They're not the movers and the shakers. They're not people in leadership positions by far. These are, these are a lot of no-name, common, probably poverty-stricken people. So I, I want us to connect to this. Go with me to 1 Corinthians, and we're going to chase this for just a second. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. I want you to see several examples of not only who's making up the church, but how they're dealing with the poor. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26. So think, the author is the Apostle Paul, right? Speaking to Christians in the city of Corinth. Um, 1 Corinthians 1, 26. Brothers, think of what you were when you were called. In other words, okay, I'm talking to people who not, used to not have a standing, used to not be able to lift your head and look people in the eye. Think of who you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many of you were influential. Not many of you of noble birth. 
But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. He chose the lowly things of the world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. It's because of him that you're in Christ Jesus who has become for us wisdom from God that is our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Therefore, as it's written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. Think about Jesus himself. He, was, he, was, he, he came unto an unwed woman, in essence, right? Teenage children, and he was laid in a cow trough. This was the king of kings and the lord of lords, and he came and he put himself in a lowly state. He humbled himself, then even to death on the cross. So Jesus never lauded his authority I mean, he tells us in Matthew 28, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth, but he didn't live his earthly existence like that. And the early church captured those same people. These were not haughty, bold, noble birthed people. These were poor people. All right, go with me again to Acts 11, 29. This gives us indication on how the church began to function then. I love this. Acts 11, 29. The disciples, each according to his ability, in other words, based on what he could do financially, decided to provide help for the brothers living in Judea. This they did, sending their gifts to the elders by Barnabas and Saul. So what were they doing? What's that mean? They were giving to the poor. They were helping fellow believers who needed help. Now, let's list off a couple of people because I don't want you to think that, that, we're, that I don't know this, that we're trailing. Now, there was a small number of affluent adherents to the gospel. Nicodemus, all right, he had money. Joseph of Arimathea, we know for sure, those of us that visited that borrowed tomb, that was Joseph's property, and he gave it. Joseph and Nicodemus put it together. Joanna, right? Um, there were others who ministered with substance. You can go read Luke chapter 8, verse 2. Um, there, were, there were plenty of there were adherents, but by and large, the central appeal of the gospel was the poor people. All the disciples, those fishermen, these weren't large commercial fishing outfits. What's the name of the TV show where they're out trying to catch crab? Um, yeah, well, Deadliest Catch. Yeah, these weren't Deadliest Catch. Those people are rich, by the way, a lot of them. They're, they're pretty wealthy. These guys on the Sea of Galilee, they weren't deadly as catch captains. They only boat, though. Well, a couple of holes in it, I'm sure. It wasn't very big. <laughs> Everybody that owns a boat, brother, ain't rich. All right. um, they were fishermen from Galilee. Can anything good? Come out of some of those areas? I mean, really? Right? 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 8. He raises up the poor from the dust. He lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with princes and inherit a seat of honor. I think it's one of the, the most amazing things of the gospel is that we will mirror this in our church. It is so attractive. It's so empowering. It's so uplifting. You want to give, give somebody a, a hand up? Give them Jesus Christ because all of a sudden the ground at the foot of the cross, you've heard it so many times, it's level. We're all on the evil, on even playing ground here, a playing field. Isn't that exciting? For some of us in this room, we're like, yeah, that's what appealed to me about Christ. I mean, that's, that's what captured those disciples. It's what still captures all of us today. And so I, I guess I want to ask, what are we doing for poor people in this church? And what can we do? And I know the easy answer. Oh, pastor, check that box. Good News Cafe, we're doing it. Well, is that enough for us? Is that enough for us? I don't think it is. Listen to this great story I came across. Uh, you know, uh, the famous and great W.A. Chriswell, pastor of First Baptist Dallas. Um, 
He tells a story of a life-changing encounter he had with poor people at his downtown church there in Dallas. And here's how it goes. He said, not long after he became the pastor of the church, he goes to the church early one morning, and he noticed this group gathered around one of the entrance doors of the sanctuary. Well, he's intrigued because there's like a crowd there, and they're pressing in to look and see, and so he makes his way through the crowd, and what he finds there on the doorways of the sanctuary was a man on the steps with his hands outreached towards the door of the church, and he was dead. And W.A. Criswell said that day, he realized that people were dying, reaching out to the church for help in the heart of his city, and it caused him to start a whole regiment of ministries that he called the Good Shepherd Ministries. And I read that actually today, and I thought, I wonder if we could start a whole line of thought in ministry called Good Shepherd Ministries. What could we do? What would it look like? So that's something that the, I always talk about the Holy Spirit percolating in my heart. And that's something that's percolating in me right now. Because I, I think that we're expanding good news in ways, but I think all of this can fall under an umbrella of good shepherd opportunities in our church so that we might go out and reach the least of these and love them the way Christ does. Um, I hope you're on board with me on that because I, I'm excited about it. And you're probably going to hear me talking about it a little bit more once I think myself clear and pray it through. Um, we can never allow the poor to become an embarrassment rather than an opportunity for ministry. And that's the key for our church. And, and we've got to fight through some things. Y'all know this. People still think the old First Baptist Church is nothing but rich people. Um, I, I met somebody the other day. Remember Wayne and Flo Rose? I miss Wayne and Flo. These were dear friends to Wayne and Flo out in the Rhone area. And this gentleman told me, he said, Wayne invited me to that church for years and years. And I always said, well, what would I wear if I go down there with all those rich people? And I said, now, you know that's not true. He said, yeah, I know it's not true now. And I said, well, come on. I miss Wayne and Flo, by the way. Wayne was fun to talk to. He was fun to talk to. But I think our church, we have to overcome some things. We have to overcome some ignorant you know ideologies and beliefs and stereotypes and all of that you walk through this church we may have a couple of people that would be termed as affluent but not many you know not many i mean we we are regular people trying to live our lives faithfully for the lord i just want us to be on the front lines in corsicana to help the poor because the scripture asks us to do that um, let me be clear let me let me clarify this and then we'll be finished for the night did i get done in time what time is it you're getting out early. All right. Now, let me say this. Poverty doesn't guarantee godliness. That's not what we're saying. I want to be clear about that. I don't think that's what Christ was saying. I know it wasn't. I know it's not what Scripture is saying. Okay? Sometimes poverty makes people bitter rather than better. And, and, if, and if it were true that poverty always led people to Christ, then our, the hotbeds of Christianity would be in the slum areas of our nation. And that's probably not the case. But I do believe it's true that poor people are open to help. And who do we know? Who, who better to help them than Christ? And who better to help them than the church? And so, so I want us to go back and kind of lead and hear the lead in to this entire chapter 2 and read it in context because chapter 1, verse 27 is the key. Remember, we closed on this last week. The religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this. To look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. In other words, if we really consolidated it, I think that it would say that care for the poor is authentic Christianity. Okay, For those who are helpless and needy, if we're in that business, God will be pleased. So I want us to do events for first responders. I want us to hand out meals to school teachers. I want us to do all of that and encourage them. We want to encourage all huge but in the midst of that, I also want us to start thinking about all of this money that we have and how it can go to work that we might care for the helpless and the poor in our community, maybe in better ways than we ever have. Let's start thinking about that because I want us to be, we say be an Acts 1-8 church, I want us to be a James 1-27 church too, okay? 
So, so let's think about that coming out of tonight, and let's ask God to birth ideas in us.